each tick makes a different round. So today we are fortunate to have as our guest uh, Peter Thiel. Uh, Peter Thiel is a venture capitalist, but also a student of American life, a proponent of American alternatives, and a citizen actively involved in the public life of the United States. Our general plan for the uh, class today is to move broadly from a discussion of the knowledge economy and its deepening and dissemination uh, to a larger discussion of political economy and the political economic alternatives for the United States. And I will then uh, ask Peter to begin by introducing himself, please. Well, uh, Professor Unger, Professor West, thank you so much for uh, having me. It's a tremendous honor to, to be here. I, I know there's a tremendous range of different topics that, uh, that we, can, uh, we can cover. Uh, and uh, I, I want to um, say a few things about, uh, maybe to start, what I see is sort of the status of uh, um, science and technology in the in the political economy and the you know the simplistic syllogism I have is that if we have enough growth in our society we can solve all problems if we don't have growth we can't solve any problems um, and then that the, uh, the 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 real driver of growth for um, for the uh, developed countries U.S. Western Europe Japan is uh, is at the uh, scientific and technological frontier and so one of the one of the questions that we should always ask is, what is the health of that frontier? How, you know, how well are things actually working in these fields? And uh, you know, sort of talks about science. You know, we have incredible. Maybe a little louder, Peter, uh, or sorry, the can, microphone. Can, okay, can, can, can people hear me? Is it on? It is on. It is on. You can use my mic. Yes. This better? Yeah. All right. Is that better? All right. We'll try, try, try this. Okay. Thanks. So we can, we can talk about uh, scientific precision to you know, an incredible degree. We have Avogadro's number in chemistry or the fine structure constant in physics. These things get measured to you know, five, six, seven, eight significant digits. Um, and yet the question of progress in science, you know, how much progress is happening, how fast is it happening, this is just uh, super vague. And if you, you know, if you ask a university president you know, what's going on, of course, everything's always great. Uh, <laughs> but uh, you end up with short sentences with um, dishonest adverbs doing all the work. So it's something like, obviously, we're progressing faster than ever, or stuff, stuff like that. Um, and this, this, this question of measurement is, um, is incredibly tricky. Um, I'll, I'll make, um, I, it is very hard. Let's, let's start by saying this is a very hard question to answer. Because uh, one of the features of late modernity is that knowledge has become extremely specialized and divided. And so we have ever narrower groups of experts of guardians guarding themselves. And so the super string theory people in physics get to tell us about how much progress they're making in super string theory. The cancer researchers get to tell us that if they get just a few more million dollars in government grant money, a cure for cancer is just around the corner. Nixon declared war on cancer about 50 years ago. It was supposed to be cured by the bicentennial by 1976. You know, maybe we're making progress, uh, but uh, it's certainly been ra rather slow going. And something like this. Uh, goes um, goes in all these different fields. It's, so it's quite a tricky question mm -hmm. to answer mm -hmm. to answer directly. Um, my my suspicion certainly is that things are not in that great a shape. And I'll uh, I'll, I'll give uh, I'll start with sort of a linguistic observation that at this point technology um, the meaning of technology has narrowed. It, today technology is basically synonymous with information technology. If we were sitting in this classroom 50 years ago, 1969. Technology, um, which was, you know, technology means the things that are changing, the things that are progressing. It would have included rockets, supersonic aviation. It would have included the green revolution in agriculture. It would have included, you know, progress in new medicine, underwater cities. You know, it, it, it was sort of advancing on all fronts. Mm -hmm. Whereas uh, the mental picture seems to be more one of, of narrow progress around um, computers, internet, mobile internet, software. We've had progress in the world of bits but not in the world of atoms. Uh, when I was an undergraduate at Stanford in the late 1980s, this was not obvious yet, and the, the, these things had slowed down so much, but with the benefit of hindsight, 
any engineering field that you would have gone into would have been a bad career choice. It was already clear by the late 80s that you didn't want to go into aero astro engineering. Nuclear engineering, your parents would probably <coughs> talk you out of doing that. But every other engineering field was bad because we, we, we're in a society where not that much is happening in the world of atoms. Chemical engineering, um, you know, material science, <coughs> electrical engineering sort of worked for about another decade. The, uh, the only field that, uh, that was sort of science related that actually worked was computer science, which in the late 80s was sort of a, uh, which was sort of the field the less talented people went into who couldn't hack it in electrical engineering. Um, and, uh, and so, you know, I think one of the, one of the great lies that, uh, that we tell in our society is, is about STEM, science, technology, you know, engineering, math, uh, because um, there are, in fact, no jobs in most of these STEM fields. The, you know, the, the, the only two STEM fields I think work are computer science and maybe petroleum engineering at this point because so few people go into them because of uh, reasons that we don't have to go into. But, uh, but every other field does not work. If you get a PhD in physics or in chemistry, there's no well-paying job for you at the end. Uh, same is true of you know, biology, things like this. I've often, I've often commented that I think the, uh, uh, you're better off as an undergraduate majoring in the humanities than in the sciences, because in the humanities, at least you know there will be no job for you at the end. Um, whereas in the sciences, uh, you will be deluded into thinking that you will be taken care of by the natural goodness of the universe. And, uh, and so you, you'll be less deluded if you, if you, uh, if you major in the humanities. So, so there is sort of, there's sort of this, this, uh, this bottom-up perspective where things are not nearly as healthy in these fields as the Google propaganda, which I will call what comes out of Silicon Valley, might indicate, which is that we have you know, runaway progress. It's, it's just accelerating. It's going faster. It's breathtaking. Uh, this is the Kurzweil, uh, McAfee type, type story. And of course, if we have runaway progress, then we might have secondary problems. There might be people who are being left behind. There might be you know, people whose jobs are getting lost. But the fundamental story of runaway progress makes the problem into simply a distributional problem, whereas I think, you know, I think the core problem is one of general stagnation where, where not very much is happening. Let me make uh, one tangential mm. observation on uh, why I think this question of progress is not one we can avoid. So we, um, mm. you know, it's, there's always a sense when I ask, you know, how fast is science, how fast is technology progressing? You know, the sort of the naive response is, well, this is just way beyond my pay grade. It's beyond anybody's pay grade. Nobody knows. Um, and yet, even if we don't want to answer the question, there are a lot of implicit ways that it gets answered all the time. And, uh, and one you know, sort of narrow, specific, but very important version. And I'll do this sort of as a thought experiment. And uh, um, if you were, um, if you were, um, if you want to get growth back to 3%, 4% a year in the US, and you could always, you know, if you got to 4% growth, we could solve all our problems. Even 3% sustainably would be pretty good. Let me suggest there are two ways to do it. One way would be you enact a set of policies that if people ever got a sense you were going to do, um, you would never get more than 10% of the vote. So you'd get rid of all immigration laws, you'd get rid of all environmental laws, you'd let people build houses wherever they want to, and so you could get growth. Maybe it would be sort of cancerous, but for at least a few decades, you could get very, very fast growth. The other sort of thing you could do, um, which, would be much <clears throat> which would be much easier, mm. would be to simply lie about the rate of technological progress. And the way the, the microeconomics of this work is it's easy to measure nominal GDP, which is a combination of inflation and real GDP. And then you have to sort of, and then the lower the inflation is, the more the real GDP grows. So if we have you know, 2% inflation and 2% real GDP growth, we have a 4% nominal GDP growth. But then if you go back and jigger the inflation numbers, you might conclude that uh, there's uh, a little bit less inflation and therefore things are actually better than, than they would appear to be. The, the way sort of one of the ways you go about rejiggering the inflation numbers, and this is sort of an arcane economics debate, is by uh, saying that the hedonic adjustment on technology is greater than expected. And so this would be, the way you would go about doing this would be you'd appoint a commission on accelerating technological change. The commission would conclude, we've had way more progress than anybody thought. It's been going much, much faster. You know, the, uh, the iPhone, the new iPhone has a smooth surface and therefore it's so much better than the old iPhone and the qualitative adjustment you have to make is bigger. And then the way this translates into public policy is if the inflation rate is lower, you need less of a cost of living adjustment. And so you don't need to pay grandma as much for her social security. And, um, and so yeah, even though the cat food that she's been eating is getting more expensive every year, that's offset 
by this, uh, by this hedonic improvement in technology. I think that there's sort of a rough history of the US where this, people have tried to jigger with the inflation numbers like this since about the 1950s. The, the one point where people really succeeded was in the mid-90s. Uh, there was this thing called the Boston Commission. There were, I think, actually three or four econ professors at Harvard were sort of uh, major culprits in, in this scheme. And they concluded that if, if you basically reduce the inflation rate by 1.1%, you could save a trillion dollars over a decade, and you could balance the budget. And, uh, and they, that, was sort of, that was going in. And then after, mm. the, after a year, the commission concluded, yeah, actually, the inflation number was 1.1% less than anyone thought, because technology was going so much better than anyone thinks. And then you could, uh, you could sort of rein in all the entitlement spending. Now, you know, as a, as a sort of free market libertarian, um, there's a part of me that sort of um, is attracted to the sort of Machiavellian dishonesty about technology, because it's a way, it's a way to get our costs under control. But as an intellectual, I think uh, you know, we need to be asking these, mm. these sorts of questions. And so I think the, the story is one of general stagnation. Um, and the micro incentives, whether it's the National Bureau of Economic you know, Research, whether it's your um, cancer researcher, whether it's, whether it's your tech entrepreneur or your venture capitalist, all the people have an incentive to exaggerate. And, uh, and that's why I think we should, you know, we should cor correct for that a little bit. And we should assume that, uh, that things are actually slower than they are. And then we have these very difficult questions, what we should do about this. Um, one sort of constitutional law framing of the question I have is that I think one of the ways our constitution works is it works against a background of growth. We have a representative government. We have people sitting around a table. And you craft legislation. There's more for you, and there's more for you, and there's more for me, and there's more for everybody. And if someone's a difficult person, well, it won't be more for them. And that kind of legislation works in a world where the pie is just growing relentlessly. It's not clear that uh, representative democracy, Republican constitutional government, whether this works at all in a world without growth. We sort of had a trial run for this in the 1930s, where the growth stopped, the systems were put under stress, and they went communist or fascist. And I think, um, I think we're sort of starting a sort of slow motion repeat of this uh, Today, I think that uh, the, the, I think the technology has been decelerating since the 1970s, but I, I would say 2008 was was a real real watershed. Uh, and if we can't get back to growth, um, I do not think you will maintain uh, the kind of government we have. It'll, mm. It, it does our, our system does not work when it's purely zero sum. If I get more by taking from you, then after a while you figure out that everyone who's made money, everyone who succeeded, is part of some kind of crazy racket. And, uh, and the whole thing just, uh, just disintegrates. So Peter, before we go further, mm -hmm. <clears throat> could you tell us more about the thesis of secular stagnation and your position with regard to it? Uh, in your view, what is true and what is false in this thesis? Let's, uh, let's frame it in terms of three questions, just sort of uh, try to have mm -hmm. some clarity around. So the first uh, question you can always ask is, is um, is secular stagnation happening or not? And um, Google propaganda says there's no stagnation. Same thing is true of all the, and there can be utopian versions like Google. There can be uh, dystopian versions like every science fiction movie that says the robots are about to kill everybody. So there are these different utopian and dystopian forms of accelerationism. And I'm on the side that, yeah, not much, not much is actually happening. Then you get into the question, why? And so, um, one sort of division is, um, is always that there's not enough money um, and that it's a, it's a, it's a demand-side problem. This would be the uh, Larry Summers view. Uh, my view is it's much more a supply-side problem. It's we're not, for some reason, we're not getting enough new stuff out there. Then on the question of why is there a supply-side problem, um, you can uh, sort of maybe one division would be you can say it's a problem of nature or of nurture or culture. And so the, the nature version of the argument would be uh, we're not producing anything more because all the low-hanging fruit has been picked. The easy inventions have been made, um, and it's hard to come up with new ones. The, the cultural argument is that it's uh, actually, there is more potential for us to do things. It's, it's actually the problem with our culture. We're too risk-averse, too much is regulated, things like this. Uh, Tyler Cowen, um, uh, the George Mason economist who also mm. wrote a book on the, the great stagnation, he believed it was a supply-side problem, <coughs> but a problem of nature, mm. and, and mine is, Mine is more on the side of culture. So I, th those are my answers to those three questions. One way of reframing the question 
interests are as a, and I think my, my answer is the minority on all three. So I think most people believe in acceleration, not stagnation. Most people think it's a demand problem, not a supply problem. Most people think it's nature, um, not culture. Um, you know, one of the reasons my, I believe my contrarian minority answers to those three questions are correct is because, uh, because certainly if you imagine a conversation with, let's say, a baby boomer scientist, and you say, um, and you start, but, and the conversation would sort of start with, scientists, we're doing all these great things. Uh, no, you're not. You haven't cured cancer. Um, second thing, second line of defense of the scientist, well, we haven't had enough money. Um, no, no, that's not true. You've gotten tons of money. We're spending more money than ever on science. That's not true. Um, third line of defense is, um, is, yeah, but it's gotten much harder. All the easy stuff's been, been fixed. Um, no, that's not true. You're just a lazy person. And, uh, and so if you think of these, the three conventional answers as the natural psychological defensive answers people have, that's why we should be skeptical of them. And that's why, you know, and mm -hmm. so my first two answers are pessimistic. My mm -hmm. third one is more optimistic. So I think, you know, mm -hmm. I think we can do better. I think, you know, I don't, I don't think the stagnation is, you know, that we're in some sort of entropic twilight we can never get out of. Mm -hmm. And so could you fill that in, the, the third hopeful element in your view? Uh, what is the content? What is the content with respect to policies? What is the content with respect to institutions? And what is the content with respect to culture? Uh, yeah, well, there's, there's, um, well, there are a lot of, you know, a lot of different uh, things I would, uh, I would, I would, I would try to, I would try to tinker with. I would say that, uh, you know, one of the areas that I was you know, very interested in undergraduate, I did not pursue, was uh, was biotech. Um, I think uh, whenever I look at it, by all rights, there's you know a tremendous amount of progress we could make there. It is um, you know it's incredibly it's incredibly regulated, and you know we get into complicated debates about about the micro uh, regulation, how, how how severe it is. But in my in my judgment, the FDA is way too onerous. It's virtually impossible to come up with with new breakthroughs. You know the polio vaccine when it was first developed in the 1950s, about you know a few dozen people got killed. They, they sort of misdosed it. If that happened today, you'd put it on a deep freeze for 20 years. And, um, and, uh, and so I think there are all these different kinds of innovations that are, are ver very difficult to make for, um, you know, on, on a regulatory basis. I think there's, um, you know, I think one of the, one of the sort of um, technological slash political uh, areas where a lot of this intersects, and that you alluded to in the opening, is the question of, um, the, uh, the big cities versus everything else. So we have, you know, we have this strange society where everybody wants to live in these big cities. Uh, and you know, if you're going to Harvard, you know, there only are four places you can go from here. It's Harvard, it's, uh, sorry, it's New York, DC, LA, Silicon Valley, maybe a few people stay in Boston, but that's about, that's about it. And, uh, and we can sort of debate, you know, why has everything gotten so centered on these big cities? Mm. Um, and what, what does it reflect? And the cities have network effects, they have better, more economic opportunity, but they also don't work very well. And the, uh, the transportation systems are 100 years old. So the iPhones, the newfangled iPhones, um, also distract you from the fact that your environment's 100 years old and you're riding through a subway in New York that's uh, probably working less well than it was 100 years ago. You know, it used to be that Brooklyn to Manhattan took 25 minutes. And with a sort of a slow motion strike or whatever's going on there, it now takes 90 minutes to get from Brooklyn to Manhattan. And when this sort of stuff happens, um, all the games have to go into um, real estate, basically. So this is you know, one, of the, one of the great sources of inequality, one of the great drivers of inequality in our society over the last 20, 30 years has been runaway housing costs. So if you, if you owned a house, if you owned your own property, you, um, you weren't really exposed to this increase in inequality. But if you're a young person, if you're an immigrant, if you're just getting started in one of these big cities, um, you're up against uh, this, this, bigger, this bigger and bigger hurdle. There's a... There's a um, late 19th century economist Henry George, who I always think is very interesting to, to look at. He was considered sort of a socialist in the late 19th century. In the early 21st century, he's considered sort of a libertarian. I think that tells you something about how much our society shifted. But, um, but, but the basic, uh, one of the basic Georgist theories was that you needed to tax monopolies. The main monopolies were in land. You needed to tax land very highly. There's a theorem called the Henry George theorem that was proven by Stiglitz about 100 years later, which basically says that if you have a city where nothing much change, not, not too much changes, which is zoned heavily, it's hard to build new things, it's hard to change things, then 100% of the value of the public good in that city gets captured by the landlords. So if you have 
if you, if you give people mm -hmm. in New York City welfare, all the welfare goes into increased rent payments. If you have a park, if you have police, all the value gets captured in increased rent. And this is, um, and the way I see, you know, and then the question is, what does one do about this? Um, it's, again, it's not a law of nature, but it is, it is, it is heavily, um, it's heavily circumscribed by available technology. So if you have, if you build highways and subways, uh, sorry, hi highways and suburbs, you can have some escape valve from this, and this is sort of why we didn't have the progressive era did not lead to a communist revolution in the early 20th century because there was a way to reopen the frontier with highways and suburbs. That highway, that suburban frontier is now semi-closed. It's too far away, the highways are clogged, the technology doesn't work. And, uh, and so I think, yeah, I think there's a question, can we come up with new transportation systems as a way to um, And that's, to that's really very this? much, well first I'll change it's a blessing to have you here to have this kind of uh, Critical exchange, Socratic exchange is always a healthy thing. Uh, um, but it, it's no accident Henry George was the favorite uh, social critic of John Dewey. That he would write elevated prose anytime he invoked Henry George. But it had something to do with the centrality of public life. Mm -hmm. The bonds that hold us together, that which constitutes the very content of what it means to be a citizen. You talk about the subways in New York and what have you. Those are all public things that are demeaned and devalued in a moment in which, given the global financialized form of capitalism that now reigns, makes it difficult for them to be recipients of the kind of attention, resources, investment, and so forth. How, do, uh, how does public life figure into your fascinating thinking, which is against the grain, and I appreciate that. It's against the, you're thinking outside of the box in it. But what role does public life play? Public infrastructure, public education, public health care, public things that hold a democracy together, given the unbelievable power of not just technology, but technology under capitalist aegis, profit-driven technology. Well, it's, it's, uh, I, I do think, you know, I, I always have a schizophrenic view on politics. I think it is, uh, mm -hmm. it is on some level toxic and therefore something one should avoid. On the other hand, it is like the air we breathe that permeates everything. And so I, I mm -hmm. tend to have this sort of schizophrenic thing where I try to avoid it most of the time and then episodically uh, try to engage in it very intensely. But I think but we I think, can all agree on the toxic character. But I think the, but look, I think, I think the, <laughs> yeah, but, but I, I think the, um, I think, I think there are a lot of things that work best if you have functioning public institutions. Mm -hmm. um, and then there are questions why they're not functioning. So why does the New York City subway system not work? Is it because people are disconnected from their city government and not participating in voting? Is it because it's, it's run by a corrupt set of unions? Is it more of a scientific technological thing where somehow we can't build you know, um, super fast railroads even though they've been built in Japan and elsewhere? Other, other places, yeah. Um, you know, so, that's, so I think it's a, I think that's, that's sort of the, uh, the ensemble of questions I would always come back to. But do you see a certain level of, if not incompatibility, intense conflict between the commitment to various ways in which liberties, personal liberties, economic liberties proliferate, and democratic forms of life? Is there a built-in tension, do you think? How do you wrestle with that tension? So, Cornell, just before Peter answers, sure, to, sure. To, to follow up on your, on your provocation, on, on the institutional side, one approach, which would be the classic libertarian or classical liberal approach, would be simply lighten the regulatory burden, untie the hands of the entrepreneurs, within the established framework of the market economy. But the alternative, the alternative of the radical Democrat or experimentalist, would be that that's not enough, and that it is necessary to innovate in the devices of economic decentralization, so that more people can have more access to more markets in more ways. Uh, and to that end, simply lightening the regulatory burden does not go far enough. That's on the institutional side. Now, on the cultural side, simultaneously, uh, there'd be the, the, the question of what can and should you do? Uh, is it enough 
to promote a cultural a culture of entrepreneurialism within the educational institutions as they are now organized? Or do you need a radical reshaping of the school system, a different method of teaching and learning, uh, a, a concerted attack on the division that exists in the United States between two tiers of the school system, uh, a dissociation of the funding of the schools from local finance, and so forth. So uh, your, your own diagnosis of the problem could be read in these two ways, as pointing either to the narrower prescriptions of the classical libertarianism, or as serving as an invitation to this broader task of institutional and cultural reconstruction. Well, I would be, you know, I, I, I as again, the narrow, my narrow focus is how do we how do we get back to the future? How do we get back to an accelerating, progressing world of science and technology? Um, and uh, if we can, I think there are lots of institutional arrangements that work, yeah. but, uh, but we shouldn't uh, give that too short a shrift. So we were talking earlier about the New Deal, the 1930s, 1940s. There were all these institutional changes, and as a libertarian, I don't like them. I'd like to say they were bad, but things still worked. The U.S. was much better off in you know, 1945 than in 1933, um, and the, the my telling of what actually worked in the 30s was that you had a whole series of tremendous breakthroughs. You got the commercial aviation industry. You got the mo the mm -hmm. the, uh, the talkies and the movies. You got the uh, um, you got the household appliances, washers, washing machines, dryers. You got uh, you got um, um, three times as many people owned cars in 1940 as in 1930. You had the beginning of the plastics industry. You had the secondary oil recovery industry. So it was a whole series of waves of innovation, and this was an incredible tailwind. And then if you have that sort of tailwind. We can run mm. socialist New Deal experiments, and it can still work. But and if you don't have the tailwind, do. um, you know, I can run my libertarian experiments, and it won't work. But, so e but even I, as a libertarian, but the, 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 the public mobilization in the face of war, I was in those say, moments, all yeah. of a sudden, even libertarians become highly friendly with the government policies. Yes. You see the, so these so are the, so, so it's state-driven policies, government policies, because Hitler's a thug, we all agree, let's make sure he doesn't have world domination. Is that a fair? That, that, that's, is that fair? that's fair, although I find, I, find these, uh, I find both of your arguments implicitly super depressing if they're true. <laughs> so let me, let me <laughs> if, it's a, if it's about education, if, uh, then it's, wow, that's hopeless. That's, that's a hopeless thing to reform. Um, Why? And if it's, well, we can talk about that in a second, but I find yours even more depressing. <laughs> Why? Because if, Why if, the, if the real driver for technology is military and uh, scientific, you know, this is what sort of mobilized society, <clears throat> One way of telling the, the history of what went wrong is that you know we had we had World War II, we got the nuclear bomb. You know, there was the New York Times editorial a few days after Hiroshima. It was something like, um, you know, um, I'm going to paraphrase this, but this is the rough tone of it. it was, um, you know, um, um, this is an incredibly impressive achievement. Um, you know, um, there are all these people who say that uh, society can't work if you have the army telling everyone what to do. Um, these are like libertarians; they were critical of. Um, and you know, if you if you'd let the prima donna scientists their own devices, maybe it would take them half a century. But when they were told by the army what to do, they could do it in three and a half years and get this invention to the world. And now, my my only observation is, New York Times doesn't write editorials like that anymore. Yeah, but um, but let's but let's true. but sort of the the military telling of the history was we had the uh, Manhattan Project. The sequel to the Manhattan Project was the Apollo space program because it wasn't good enough to have nuclear weapons. You needed to send them around the world really fast, and you needed to do it many times over to kill everybody. <coughs> and, um, and this basically culminated and, and reached some kind of insane culmination in the early 1970s. And that's roughly when the mm -hmm. tech stagnation mm -hmm. started. And, yeah, so, see, and so war is not a motivating thing. We have enough nuclear bombs still to uh, kill everybody many times see, this over. Is, I, I, I hear you what you're saying, but I mean, as someone trained in philosophy as you were at Stanford. You know there was a brother named William James taught here at Harvard who wrote an essay called The Moral Equivalent of War. See, war is not a metaphor to be deployed only in, 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 as a religion military. You can declare a war on poverty. You can declare a war on white supremacy. When they needed that, we had apartheid in the South at that time, right? So we wanted double victory. 
We want to win the war internationally. Let's win the war against American apartheid. Let's win the war against poverty. Let's win the war against ignorance. There's other ways in which we can marshal the warlike spirit that's I, still tied to I, some I, democratic I, possibility. I, 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 don't, I, I think the metaphor only works when the, the underlying thing like war is something that can still be won. In, in, the, in, the, in the core military context. So William James was writing pre-World War I. I don't know if he would have used that metaphor after 1914. I think that, uh, you know, and I think we had, you know, we had certainly the war on poverty, we had, you know, the war on segregation, right, but uh, right. the war on cancer under Nixon. I, I am not aware of a war metaphor being used since the early 1970s. But it's and, not. And so, but so yeah, it, I think you're right. But we're, it's not here. What you're saying. If, people, if people haven't done it for 50 years, but I, I've been trying to use it for the last 40 listened, years. They haven't listened to <laughs> it's not kicking in. It's just not well, kicking it's, in. But it's, it's because, war, because war, is, war is scary. We don't. We don't actually want war. Yeah. Well, it depends but, on but, what war you fight. No, no, we don't want to interrupt. And we got we got to open it up too. But it's not just a metaphor about about motivation, because it has a content. So. One element in the content is massive mobilization of national resources at the sacrifice of current consumption uh, with very high marginal tax rates, for example. Uh, the second element is radical institutional innovation, not formalized for the most part, but radical nevertheless, including uh, innovation in the forms of collaboration of government with private enterprise. Uh, and, and with the result of a duplication of GDP in four years. So uh, well, look, with I, proven success. Look, mm. if, if, if one believed that, then you know, I'd be fine paying more in taxes if I thought we could go back to a government that actually, actually did things. I think you know, there's a way to think of libertarianism as a philosophy of political decline. It's um, as our government institutions work less well it's natural for them to do less. The Libertarian Party got started in the US in the 1970s, which was the decade where our government institutions stopped working. It has been gaining ground for 40 to 50 years. Libertarianism, it's not a timeless and eternal truth. It's a historical truth. It's an adaptation. And it's more true now than ever because um, mm. our, our political institutions work less well than ever. Mm. If, we, um, if we take, um, and I think like one, one difference between governments and companies, companies have a natural half-life. After a while, they die. They get replaced by, by younger, more vital, healthier things. It's very hard to do that in, in government. NASA was, was very innovative. You start NASA in the 1950s, mm. 1960s. Mm. You have great scientists. 60 years later, yes. it's, a, it's a bureaucracy. And we don't have, we don't have ways to, to clear the system but up. Then, but then, as you imply, the problem is the circularity. The, this minimalism about collective action uh, risks becoming a self-fulfilling prophecy. Sure, but it's also, but, but on, the, on the left, it's, um, it's if you have to defend every last existing institution, no matter how sclerotic it is, that's, that's actually ultimately going to help us on the libertarian side. And of that's, course. That's sort of what you're, mm -hmm. that's what you're increasingly locked into doing. And this is where you know, the New Deal history is impressive, but I don't know what it means, because you started mm. with basically mm. no federal, virtually no federal government. You had a completely blank slate. You know, in the 1930s, 1940s, the people working in the federal government in DC were far more talented than the average people managing uh, uh, companies throughout the United States. Um, and today, it's, you know, it's, 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 it's very the much the opposite. Mm -hmm. And it's very, you know, we, like a minimal thing. That, you know, one, one, one did like at least was able to do even in Brazil. A minimal thing would be: could you actually move the capital city of the U.S. elsewhere? Could you just move it to some other part of the country? That, that would force people to do something new, and that's that sounds beyond insane to even suggest. Mm. We, we should probably open yeah. it up. Question? Yes, jump in. <laughs> Um, well, look, I, th I think that, uh, I th I think that uh, the, um, the, the um, innovation challenge that I've described is, is fairly independent of, 
of, um, of, of, of that. Uh, you know, I, I don't think that um, women or minorities have less access today than they had 50 years ago or 60 years ago. And I think we had more innovation in our society in the 1950s and 1960s than we do today. And so it's, um, you know, it's always a, you know, it's always a fairly uh, simple one. You know, the, the, um, the um, you know, I, I'm often asked this question in the, you know, in, in the context of Silicon Valley, you know, how do we get more women engineers? How do we get more women executives? And, uh, and uh, my answer is, um, that's not even, you're not even asking the right question. You know, the question is, how do you get more women to found companies? Because what matters is that you start a company. Um, and that's what sets the culture in, in, in Silicon Valley. Of the, you know, and it, again, it's, it's extremely unbalanced. I'll just, mm. you know, I'll, mm. I'll agree it's very unbalanced. Of the, you know, of the 150 tech unicorn companies, um, private tech companies worth a billion dollars or more, only three have women co-founders. Um, I sort of checked the, looked at this about two years ago, so it may have been updated a little bit. And those three, they were all husband and wife teams, which is not what the feminists want to hear. So that's, the, but I, I don't have a solution, but you should, you should, be, you should, you should just start a company. <laughs> but what are the conditions under which you start those companies? Well, you need some ideas. You need to be able to inspire people. But you have to have access to capital, access to credit, you know, I, some I, foot. Some. I, always, I, always think, I always think the capital part gets exaggerated. Mm. Uh, we, we have, we've, ha we've had a world of zero interest rates, government printing money for a decade. There's way more capital than anybody knows what to do with. Uh, uh, we have too much capital. I don't know what to do with it on my venture fund. Um, the same problem is, is true uh, ac across the board in Silicon Valley. We need more good ideas. Mm -hmm. Question, yes, in the front. Uh, so I started a company 12 years ago, uh, coming out of Detroit. So this issue I run into, though, is when, you're, when someone coming from my experience, grew up in Detroit, went to Rich, Michigan, started a company that, that helps build the issues you were talking about. But then you have, there's this way you have to like reframe what these values look like. You talked about tapping into, you know, this other potential. And then as soon as you start that conversation, it gets framed as like a feminist narrative or a humanities narrative. And I'm like, no, I'm talking about numbers when I'm going to pitch to investors, but they don't have enough cultural capital to understand why what I'm presenting them is actually an economic model and not a humanities model. So I'm curious, like, how do you, when you're in that position and you have a, a level of perhaps expertise, whatever it might be, understanding these cultural things that translate into dollars, how do you reframe that when there's someone sitting across the table who doesn't understand the dynamics that you're working with to realize why it's actually a financial issue and not a humanities thing? Well, it's look, I, I, it's I, 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 it's hard for me to sort of go into like a detailed critique of mm. why your company you know should have succeeded or why it didn't no, succeed. Not, or, his or company's like, doing very good. <laughs> <laughs> no, I know he's, he's, he's doing well. well don't, don't worry about that. <laughs> He's speaking on behalf of some other people. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I think it's, it's more about reframing. Like right, right. Where did these conversations take place? So, a specific example, I was pitching something, it ended up working and going really well. But initially, we had, we had a series of meetings, right? And every meeting was with this wealthy person, and he was really busy, so he had 30 yes. minutes in a boardroom. And I kept, finally, I kept saying, can we just go on a hike? And we're in LA. And so finally, I got him to go on a hike, and we had a great you know, hour and a half hike up in Griffith Park, and then he got the idea I was pitching. But initially, he wanted to meet in the boardroom and sit across the desk. And what I was trying to communicate to him, what wouldn't fit into that model of communication. So how do we reframe where these conversations take place, how they take place, yeah. so that we can actually so, have So I, 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 don't, I don't believe that. So I think your answer is the kind of answer I, I believe. But it's sort of, but, but the question, I think, is, is misplaced. So I, I don't think there's a process we can come up with that works. There's no sort of formulaic process. People are always looking for a formula. Mm -hmm. it's, it's not like Shark Tank, where you, you, know, you have to figure out the right pitch. You have to figure out the right way to tell people exactly what you're doing in 30 seconds in an elevator or something like that. <laughs> it's, um, it's, uh, it's, you know, and, um, and people, but people are, look, I mean, they're desperately looking for a formula because, you know, you want, you want a formula. Um, if, but if they're looking, if, if, you know, if, if, you know, if it's just you follow this formula and you'll, you'll be rich, right. that's, uh, right. that, that right. might be great or it might be just that I'm, you know, I'm telling you a bunch of BS. Um, and, and then I think what, what happens in practice, it, it is always, you know, it's somewhat serendipitous. It's, uh, you know, there, you know, um, there, there's, some, there's something about, you know, it's sort of self-fulfilling. People think it's going to work, and then, mm. then, it, then it somehow takes off. But it's, it's yeah, yeah, the access problem is always tricky. You know, when I, when I started, you know, when I started uh, PayPal in 98, 99, I, uh, you know, I probably had to pitch 100 separate people over the course of, of uh, the first year. And, um, you know, it was, it was, 
you know, you, you knew people, you sort of got, got in front of them, some of them, but it was, uh, it, was, it was still really hard. It's always a really hard lift. We've got the question here, then one in the back, these two, and then, then we'll shift. Is that right, Buff? Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. 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 Look, I think I think the uh, the um, uh, entrepreneurial venture capital form mm-hmm. is, is a very tricky one to solve mm-hmm. because uh, it's, um, it's 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 very risky. Uh, it's, um, it's 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 naturally decentralized. If you had the government simply issuing uh, venture capital checks, um, it w- it would go catastrophically wrong because you know most companies are actually bad ideas uh, and aren't even clo- aren't even close to working. So those are those are the that's sort of where I, I'm not quite sure what one does about the venture capital ecosystem. Now, most business isn't equity financed. Most business is is debt or credit financed, and um, and the policy thing that I would suggest as a concrete policy would be that uh, we should try to figure out ways to shift credit to small business mm. and away from consumers. Um, and so, as mm-hmm. a small business, mm-hmm. when you're starting a small business, it's very hard to get credit. You can normally you have to normally put on a credit card, which has extremely high interest rates. Um, and uh, and, and uh, whereas and whereas consumers, you know, they they they, they borrow uh, a lot because it's easy to borrow, and they never think about how hard it is to pay off. Businesses aren't responsible, you know, they're not personally liable, but uh, but they're off. It would be much better if we had credit directed towards business and away from consumers. So this is uh, you know the East Asian economic model. It's very strange, you know, why things work at all in a place like you know Japan or or um, you know the East Asian <coughs> countries. Um, but I think I think sort of the key. Uh, macroeconomic insight they had was to um, make it hard for consumers to get credit and easy for for businesses to get credit, and that somehow is is, is a mm. you know is, is a much mm. is a much better is a much better approach. Now you know this is mm. this is this is not popular because we don't want you know you have to have high sales taxes. You have to say you know you can't borrow money. You can't you know um, it's, it should be harder to buy a house. Um, you have to have a bigger down payment to a house. So all, th- those are the things you do when you restrict consumer credit, but uh, but if I had a choice, I would I would definitely do that and, and shift to, to small businesses. And these are the debt-driven businesses, mainly small businesses, yes, that, that, different from equity-driven yeah, businesses. Yeah. Which yeah, the vast majority of businesses are, are, debt, are debt-driven. Yeah. yeah so yeah, like an, an equity, a venture capital equity business, it's like I have to make, I have to have a chance to make 10 times my money to justify the risk of investing it. And that's there are a lot of businesses that just don't have those attributes. You know, if you have a mm-hmm. restaurant, sort of a local business, it, you know, you can make money, but uh, it's you we'll know, work your family to death, your friends to well, death. And... <laughs> well, not, not hopefully not to death. <laughs> Nearly. We have a question in the back before we shift. Yes. Well, I'm, I'm saying that's 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 how you would change things in, in Silicon Valley, if, because because the, the it is it is centered on the founders of companies, and I'm sorry that's 
if you know that's if, if you're not dealing with that, um, you're not going to change things. I understand you don't want to do it personally, and I'm not saying you have to do it personally, but that that's the problem that has to be solved. Let's see. The uh, well, the, the context is uh, I was um, I was involved in this uh, litigation against uh, Gawker Media, uh, where I helped underwrite uh, Hulk Hogan, the uh, the wrestler, in a in a you know, successful lawsuit. I mean, again, we can go the sort of complicated fact pattern, but basically, uh, um, uh, they had uh, published they had secretly filmed um, Mr. Hogan having sex with his best friend's wife. It was filmed in the privacy of the bedroom, and then it was shown on the internet to uh, millions of people. Um, and uh, and you know it was it was and it was basically um, and then you know once once we finally got it to, to trial you had sort of a pretty big runaway jury verdict where you know it was basically our, our lawyers asked for you know thought the, the most they could ask for with a straight face was a hundred million dollars and then after seven hours the jury came back and awarded Mr Hogan 115 million um, so a lot of these things are always very fact specific and you have to mm. go through a lot mm. of the, the facts but the uh, you know, look, I, the, way I would, the way I would frame it is our Constitution doesn't just have a First Amendment. It also has a Fourth Amendment, which is against unreasonable search and seizure. That's where the right to privacy comes from. Um, and, um, and there are certain cases where the First Amendment should dominate, and there are other cases where some of the other ones should dominate. And I would, I would submit that um, a sex tape illegally stolen, filmed in the privacy of someone's home, um, is, is much closer to a core Fourth Amendment um, uh, you know, right against invasion of privacy, both by government actors as well as private corporate actors, um, and, is, um, and is, is, is not a First Amendment thing. This was the way, you know, this was the, way the, whole, uh, the whole trial proceeded. They, they started by, you know, they, they just argued First Amendment, First Amendment the whole time. And it was, you know, it was, uh, we're journalists, we get to do whatever we want because we have the First Amendment. Um, they argued the law, we argued the facts. No, it's, it's not about the First Amendment. It's just a sex tape. So, Peter, let's, let's now begin to broaden this conversation to the, uh, to the political economic agenda that we've been considering here in the course. And to that end, I simply want to restate for you three of the themes of that agenda that we have been discussing here. And, and here you speak to them in any order that seems to you most useful. So the first theme has been <clears throat> the relation of the backward parts of the production system to the most advanced parts, and especially the fate of what is now the vanguard of production, the knowledge economy, or the learning economy. Uh, it is present in every part of the production system, not just in high-tech manufacturing, but Everywhere it is present only as a fringe that excludes the vast majority of firms and workers. And surely this insular character of the new productive vanguardism must be part of the explanation for both economic stagnation and the aggravation of inequality. And uh, here the basis of discussion has been that we shouldn't take this insularity of the advanced economy as something that is natural or necessary, although it may be always the most probable outcome. And we should explore the means by which this productive vanguard could be both deepened and disseminated. The second theme is, has been the theme of the relation of labor to capital. In the context of this change in the advanced forms of production, uh, there is a demand for flexibility in labor markets. And in a large part of the world, including the United States, flexibility seems to have become a pretext for the condemnation of an increasing part of the labor force to radical economic insecurity. 
and insecurity specifically in the form of precarious employment. Uh, insecurity and uh, a downward tilt to the returns to labor seems to be incompatible with a dynamic of productive enhancement. And the third theme that we've, been, we've discussed in this context as part of the core of a progressive political economy is the theme of the relation of finance to production, finance to the real economy, uh, under, the, under the view that uh, finance should serve the productive agenda of society rather than being allowed to serve itself, that it is not enough to regulate it. What we want is to adopt innovations that tighten the link between finance and the real economy and increase the likelihood that finance will be a good servant rather than being allowed to be a bad master. Uh, those are the three themes that we have discussed, and we'd like to hear you on them, because they seem to be notably absent from the conventional progressive discourse in the United States today. Well, there's, I, I feel I could spend a lot talking on all, all three, three of these. Of so let's, let's say, uh, let's, let's summarize them. Um, you know, um, um, expanding beyond the insularity of the knowledge economy. Secondly, what do we do about the precariat, uh, the people who uh, feel like super um, un un insecure in our system? And then third, um, uh, you know, um, the correct degree of financialization of, 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 of the system and, and, and how, how, to th how to think about that. Um, so let me, in, in, in that order, mm -hmm. a slightly disjointed mm -hmm. way, let me just throw out a few, a few thoughts. Um, you know, and again, there are all these places where I can question some of the premises, and I don't think that's that constructive. So I'm going to sort of assume that this framing is, is, is essentially correct. Um, it strikes me that um, the place to look on the knowledge economy is, is very much on the, on the university side. So if we have this idea of knowledge as something that's fundamentally positive sum, if I know something, mm. it doesn't mean mm. that um, mm. you can't mm. know it too, mm. or I, that, that, uh, that knowledge has this sort of extreme positive zero sumness to it. The question is always, you know, why there are lines around. You know, we, we, you know you, there's often sort of this expression: you go to Yale or you go to jail, and um, and you know, we'd like that there to be sort of more of a spectrum on this. What I what I would submit to you, uh, one of the challenges with the universities and the elite universities, is that's not how they think of the knowledge economy at all. And uh, here's, I'll give you the thought experiment. If you were the president of Harvard University or Stanford, and you had some fantasy of getting lynched by a mob of angry alumni, angry students, and angry faculty, then you should give a speech, something like the following. Um, the knowledge economy is very important. Um, it's something uh, that we're doing a great job educating people for. Um, and obviously, because it's such a positive something, we're going to triple our enrollment. Uh, over the next 20 years. It'll take us a while to build the buildings, but over the next 20 years, we're going to triple the enrollment of Harvard. After all, you know, in, in uh, 1970, you know, there were about 200 million people in the U.S. It was mostly, and Harvard's mostly a U.S.-centric institution. Now there are 7.5 billion people in the world. Um, it's a global institution. So we're, we're serving 37.5 times as many people as we were serving 50 years ago, and uh, we're only going to triple the enrollment. We're not, we're not talking about increasing it by a factor of 37. Um, and uh, you... I mean, I, I don't know how fast it would be till you got fired. Um, and it's because um, the self-understanding of this mm. institution is, you know, the propaganda is that it's a, it's a knowledge economy, it's, it's, a, it's a knowledge factory, it's, it's an educational institution. The self-understanding, the real self-understanding, is this is a Studio 54 nightclub. And we have a, you know, we have a massive velvet rope with lots, a long line of people on the outside trying to get in. And the longer the line, the more reassuring it is to the small number of people who are who are mm. in here. And uh, mm. and um, wow. and so uh, so we have to we have to think really hard about the propaganda versus uh, you know what the realities are. You know, and uh, yeah, in theory, education is positive, sum, inclusive. Mm. It's something for everybody to learn. In practice, it's uh, it's this crazy zero sum tournament. I think all of you are right. If you, if you can go to Harvard, you should, probably should go to Harvard. You have to be very careful to go to a school ranked number 20th or number 100th, because maybe the diploma gets to be a dunce hat in disguise or something like that. But, uh, but the system, you know, the system, you know, every time people use the word, it's, it's almost Orwellian. You know, every time people in these university contexts use the word inclusive, they mean exclusive. Or it's, it's you know, it's, it's, 
things mean their own opposites all the time. So, so anyway, I, I think the, the um, so I, I, would, I would redirect the knowledge economy question to, um, to uh, the nature of the, the universities very, very centrally in our system. So I'm just giving some soundbite mm -hmm. re, uh, responses. The, um, you know, the, the precariat, uh, the, uh, the sort of the insecurity that people feel. Um, slightly different way I would frame it is, um, I don't think there's a problem with people getting jobs in our society. You know, the unemployment rate's three and a half percent. It's, uh, it's, it's quite low. Um, it's just most of the jobs don't pay very well. Yeah, for the living and, wage. Or, and, 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 then, um, and then I think, again, the more nuanced version of this is that we have about half the country where it's, um, it's actually very, um, it's very easy to afford to live, but there are no jobs. And then the other half of the country, it's very expensive to live, and there are jobs that pay you know, moderately well, but not too well. And on average, you're fine. You know, the median wage for the median house in the U.S. is, is actually perfectly adequate. The median house price in the U.S. is uh, two hundred fifty thousand um, dollars. And you know, if you if you have a you know fifty sixty thousand dollar year income, you can easily afford a two hundred fifty thousand dollar house. The problem is, you know, people aren't they don't exist in cyberspace. They're not some sort of average median person living in an average median house. You either live in a dysfunctional, high-cost mega city where um, you, you, you make some money but can, can barely stay ahead because of the sort of Henry George mm -hmm. um, theorem problem, or you're, or you're somewhere else. So I, I, again, I, I don't want to redirect it all towards zoning laws and real estate, but I think that's the, uh, you know, that, that, is the, that, is the, that is the real challenge. If you look at other Western countries, the ones that, that I feel are the healthiest are the ones where um, it's, it's not as centralized on the megacities. You know, France, Britain are even more screwed up than the US because it's all just in one city, London or Paris. You know, I, think, I think Germany is, is relatively healthy. Japan weirdly works, even though it's centralized on Tokyo, but public transportation works so that it's, it's like one big, uh, one big relatively affordable city. But, uh, but the economies that are centered on these um, very big cities with extremely antiquated systems um, you're, you're, you know, it's, it's, I, I think you're not going to solve it until you rethink uh, transportation or the, the sort of the, the structure of the uh, economy. And so that's, it's not the only part of the answer, but that's, that's the one I would, you know, I would always, uh, I would always redirect things towards. You know, I think the, um, let me see what to say on the, on the financial side. I, I think I, bro I broadly agree with you that uh, um, there's, you know, there's a healthy role for finance, and then there's a, a degree to which an economy can become over-financialized. I think uh, the peak of over-financialization in the U.S. was probably 2007, when maybe half the profits in the U.S. were effectively made by banks or other financial firms. And so if you sort of, you sort of say, like, what, what percent of the profits in the capitalist system should be made by uh, financial entities? I don't know, my intuition would be 10 to 15 percent is healthy. 50% uh, is way too much. Mm. Um, I think the number today, it's come down post-08, but it's still maybe 25 to 30%. Mm. So it's still too much, mm. but it's, um, it's, uh, it's, it's partially receded. And, and what, what do you do about that? Though? But, 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 it's well, not, but it's not just a question of the distribution of profit, right? It's, it's a question of the relation between activity in the capital markets and uh, real economic activity, increase of output or enhancement of productivity. So the problem is not the, the, the speculative element in finance. The problem is its dissociation from the productive agenda of society. Yes, but let's, let's, let's drill down that word dissociation just a little bit more. And, and uh, you know, the most dissociated you can be, the most disconnected you can get is in a purely globalized world. And so I, I often think the way to think of Manhattan in the United States as the financial center, the way you should think of it pictorially is it's like an island. It's off the coast, but it's really a thousand miles off the coast of the US. And the business model of Manhattan consists of people uh, producing little pieces of paper that say, you owe me money. And we need that. We don't, it shouldn't be as big a part of the, the economy as it is. And the, the, the historical question is, why did it get to be so big? Why did it get to be so extreme in 2007? Um, and, um, and again, the, you know, the sort of the, the simple, simplified one-word answer I would have is globalization. Because globalization is what 
makes things the most disconnected. It's not the local banks. It's not even the national banks. It's these crazy global capital mm. flows that mm. direct things. And you can think of um, you can think of the banking system in the U.S. as uh, the mirror image of the current account deficit. And so if you sort of plot on a you know, x-axis of time, uh, y-axis, you start with the current account deficit. It was zero in 1980. It went down to minus 3.5% of GDP in 87, back to zero in 91. And then it went uh, by 06, 07 down to 6, 7% of GDP. And then in the 08 thing, it's now around minus 3%. So I, I can draw it, but just, just picture the chart. Um, and then the mirror image of that is, is um, a chart that reflects the dollars that flow into the US. So we're sending money out in the current account deficit. The other countries aren't buying goods or services, but they're sending us money back. The money that gets sent back gets sent back to the banks. And so the bigger the current account deficit, the more money flows into the banks. And so um, in 1987, banks were doing really well. 91, when it was down to zero, 2,000 SNLs go broke. Mike Milken goes to jail. That's what happens when the current account deficit comes down. The money runs out for banks. The biggest current account deficits we had were in 06, 07 at the peak of the housing bubble, $800 billion a year current account deficit. And the way that gets sterilized is that you have banks telling um, uh, foreign investors $800 billion worth of lies on why they should put the money into subprime mortgages and all, all this sort of stuff. And you have this sort of globalized uh, financial system. And you know, that partially broke in, um, in 07, 08. It's, uh, it still has a long ways to go. And so I would say, uh, again, this is, you know, I'd, I'd say one way we get to a healthy financial system would be that we have no current account deficit. Then the banks will have less money. They'll have less power over the economy. It will be more localized. But uh, to get our current account deficit back to zero probably, um, you know, um, uh, requires a set of policies that would be labeled as very anti-globalist. I'm, I'm in favor of them. But, mm, uh, mm. but that's because that's you what talked you about to, one the, of the, the banks premises. are linked to globalization. You, you know, talked about one of the premises, though, that, that Roberto, Roberto was putting forward. A basic one is forms of democratizing the market such that everyday people have access to resources so they can live lives of decency. What is the strongest argument that you have, or your strongest suspicions, of various forms of democratizing markets? Um, well, it's, it's, uh, or even you, maybe you agree in your own libertarian way. Um, well, you know, this, this there's of different a, ways of access in private sector, public sector, and so forth. Well, I think there are all sorts of forms of access that uh, you want, you want Absolutely. people to have. Absolutely. Um, you, you have to always be careful that the access isn't counterproductive. So, uh, so for example, at the peak of the housing bubble in 05, 06, um, you know, more people, underprivileged, minorities, et cetera, had access, but they ended up buying the houses at the top of the bubble. And so you have to always, you know, there's always a substantive question of, of, um, of how, how, to, how to best do this. I would tend to focus less on the consumption side, more on the, uh, on the small business side. Um, but then I think the, um, but I think the, the anti-globalist version of this is if, um, if the banks are these, you know, money center banks uh, lending money on a global basis, they don't care about the local community. So if you're, you know, if you're, if you're um, Citibank, Citigroup in New York City, you don't care about, um, you don't have to lend money to, to people living right, in the five yeah, boroughs five or boroughs. anything like that. Um, you can go anywhere in the world. So as you, as you deglobalize, you know, maybe, maybe you're getting rid of certain types of efficiencies, but it does push, push it back towards this, uh, this, this much more local question. Mm -hmm. Questions in this corner and on the left. We go here, here. What about some sisters of all uh, colors right here? We got here, here, and here. Go right ahead, though. I would, I would say, I would say my, 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 my leverage point would be we need to get rid of the current account deficit. And then, then the banks will be weaker. I guess I'm curious where that, to me, that contradicts um, a sort of free market view of the world. I don't, I don't know exactly what you term the libertarian free market view, but I mean, the banks are essentially um, franchised.
defined by law. Uh, I guess how do you reorient uh, the market and you know come up with this free market ideal that, that you advocate for without relying on the government? Since the since the you know our public system of exchange is a mar is a government design system. Well, I don't, I I would never I would never claim that you um, you get rid of the government altogether or there's that some of these mm. things aren't you know profoundly political. So um, so on the you know you weaken the banks when you get to uh, no trade deficits, no current account deficits. Um, I believe that if you had free trade, fair trade, um, you would have very uh, very um, very um, low trade deficits. We don't have fair trade. We have extremely unfair trade that's very asymmetric. Mm. Mm. Where um, you know uh, we have few restrictions on our side. Other countries have lots of restrictions. And um, and the and the way the way this works is uh, when you have this sort of unbalanced trade where we export 100 billion a year to China and they export 500 billion a year to the U.S. It's um, it's a subsidy to the financial system because the extra 400 billion goes to the banks. So that's number one. Number two, it's a subsidy to U.S. consumers because we get cheaper stuff from China. But number three, it's a sub it's a it's a subsidy to Chinese workers over U.S. workers. Uh, and so people. Have jobs in China, um, you know. You, um, you 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 don't get a manufacturing job in the U.S., but um, you know you get uh, cheap stuff at Walmart. And uh, and the you know if if you if you had if you actually had um, uh, fair trade, and I think this is, it does require mm. a lot more political intervention than people have been willing to to enact. Uh, I think all these things would rebalance. It would be bad for banks. It would be bad for U.S. consumers, but it would be great for U.S. workers. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, my question is sort of related to uh, your stance on education. It's kind of like a two-part question. So I know like you have like a fellowship called the Yale Fellowship where uh, you give, I believe, like $100,000 a month mm -hmm. to back like drop out of college. Um, and I remember when I read it, I read someone else who had like a counterpoint using your life saying like they would be willing to bet that people who go through and maybe even get like a law degree like you did would be better if they were to like have So I, um, there's, you know, I think if I think if I had dropped out, then I would get attacked for um, for not knowing what I missed. So I, I think I get attacked either way, uh, either I'm a hypocrite or an ignoramus. So I um, prefer being a hypocrite to being an ignoramus, even though I think I'm really neither. And I think I'm neither because I think um, it's it's not the case that one size fits all. And um, I, I'm not. Uh, I've never advocated that everybody. Um, drop out. Actually, the, the term we use is stop out because you can always go back. The college is um, one of the ways they get evaluated is by what percent of people graduate. So you can stop out of Harvard for five years. They will always take you back because they're worried about managing those numbers. Um, but uh, but so yeah, drop out or stop out of college, start a company. Um, uh, I've never claimed that everybody should become an entrepreneur. That everybody should do that. I think it's important for our society and it's good for our society. But I, I don't think everybody uh, should do that. I also don't think. Um, that it's, it's that healthy for us to say that everybody should go to an elite college. It doesn't work for the reasons we already articulated because mm. it, they're running the Studio 54 uh, nightclub system. Um, and, uh, but I think, um, I, think, uh, I think fundamentally we need um, to have, you know, a, you know, a healthier society would be one in which there are many different um, good opportunities for people. Um, and, um, and for average people, for people at an elite level, you know, it's one of the one of the weird dynamics is that on an elite level, you're told you know that, that you can only go to one of these four or five colleges. Then you can become a lawyer, a doctor, a management consultant, or a banker, and maybe maybe a software person. Maybe that one's been added in the last decade. Um, and so the, the smarter you are, the narrower the range of things are that uh, that you can do. You know, the um, <clears throat> the the analogy that I've often used for uh, for uh, universities is um, is that it's they are as corrupt today as the Catholic Church was 500 years ago on the eve of the Protestant Reformation. And it's the same sort of stuff that we're being told. You know, the, uh, you have sort of the uh, a, a priestly professorial class that um, um, is sort of very sinecured. You have, uh, 
You have um, runaway tuitions that are like the indulgences. Um, there's a salvation story where um, if you get a degree from, um, from Harvard, you will end up in a good place. If you don't get a college degree, you will end up in a very bad place. So um, it's, 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 it, it is like, it, this is the atheist church. And, uh, and uh, what I'm arguing for is, 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 a, is a second reformation. Um, and it's not to replace it with some unitary alternative system. I think it will be, you know, I think it will be um, a, a whole range of different things. So I'm not, you know, trying to just create, you know, a unitary alternative to the atheist mm -hmm. church. Peter, could I could I just press you on that? Because in your in your in your answer to the <clears throat> to the first theme, <clears throat> the theme of the insularity of the knowledge economy and the overcoming of the insularity, <clears throat> you focused exclusively on the educational element, <clears throat> and especially the role of the universities. Now, consider a, a historical comparison that we've taken up here in the course, <clears throat> which is the comparison to the organization of entrepreneurial family-scale agriculture in the United States <clears throat> in the first half of the 19th century. <clears throat> the Americans created a highly efficient agriculture, a family scale, <clears throat> but with entrepreneurial characteristics. In other words, it wasn't a subsistence agriculture. <clears throat> and <clears throat> to do that, they had to create a kind of agricultural market that had not existed before. It was not simply the regulation of the market, and it was not the abolition of existing regulation. They actually distributed the lands. That is, they created stakes and assets that didn't exist before. Uh, they did establish the land-grant colleges, the equivalent to the universities that you mentioned. Uh, but they then uh, organized a system of agricultural extension that would bring the insights of agricultural science to the producer on the ground. Uh, and they combine this with the invention of a whole set of legal and financial devices, like uh, agricultural income insurance, crop insurance, food stockpiles, safeguarding family agriculture against the unique combination of economic risk and climate risk. So in other words, it was a large operation involving a combined set of technological, organizational, and institutional innovations, associating the government with a small-scale producer and fomenting in the relations among the small-scale producers what today we would describe as cooperative competition. That is, they competed against one another but they also pooled resources achieving economies of scale. Now, it's, it's, it, if we take this as, as an analogy in thinking about the dissemination of the knowledge economy, it seems that what we would need to do would be more ambitious and more complicated than this 19th century example, not less ambitious and less complicated. Uh, and that would then point us away from this regulatory minimalism to an institutional maximalism. Is, does, doesn't the example suggest that we redirect our reasoning in that, in that way? Um, well, I think it can point to a number, like even granting all your premises, I think it can point in, in a variety of, of different directions. Um, the, uh, the, um, the part that, I, that resonates very powerfully for me is I am I'm struck by how we live in a world in which people no longer believe in complex coordination of any sort. And, uh, and that uh, um, mm. if, if you have something where you have a lot of different pieces that are coordinated in a very complicated way, uh, people's instinctive reaction, even if they're center left, you know, trained at institutions like this, will be, that's a Rube Goldberg contraption. It's never going to work. It's so complicated. It, it, mm. will, it, mm. will, it will break down. There's a, there are, the, the, you know, the 19th century, you had governmental, you had private public versions of this. You also had purely private versions. You know, the second industrial revolution, you know, the Ford factory, things like these, they were innovations in complex coordination where you put, pull together, you know, a lot of different parts of the supply chain in a very complicated way to do something, you know, um, radically new at a, at a very different um, uh, efficiency and, 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 and price point. 
Um, but I think, yeah, I think we've, we've given up on complex coordination in governmental forms. We've also given up on it in, uh, in private sector forms. You know, the, the private sector version is, it's striking how few companies have anything like uh, complex coordination. I think Apple was impressive because they, you know, they had to build the whole supply chain in China to get, get the iPhone. And that's why nobody understood it, nobody saw it coming, because nobody thinks in those terms. My, uh, my friend uh, Elon Musk's Tesla uh, electric car company, you have to get a lot of different pieces together. Like maybe it'll work, maybe it won't work, but uh, it's, it's way more complicated than, um, than launching an app on a, on a computer from, mm. from, your, from your home. So I, I'm, I'm very struck how we've moved away from you know, all forms of complex coordination. I think part of it has to do with the failure of central planning and communism. But, uh, but you know, um, I think that s even socialism is better with a five-year plan than without a five-year plan. I, I like socialism with a five-year plan more than socialism without a five-year plan. And I'm, I, I, I believe that in general, there's something to be said for, Some kind for, of plan for planning and required. coordination generally. No matter. We had a um, question here. Uh, go right ahead. Mm -hmm. Uh, well, I, 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 I t uh, um, it's a fair point. I'm, it's not something I'm, as f I, sh I should maybe be more focused on it than I am. I'm, I'm sort of focused on you know, the, the thin tip of the spear where I think you know, progress and the future um, are, are happening. It obviously doesn't work in a context where the rest of the society falls apart, where you know, if the power grid goes down or uh, thing, things just don't work, um, that's, that's sort of, uh, you, they're, they're both, they are both necessary. Now, I, um, the reason I would still always come back to the need for growth, for innovation, is I, I tend to think, you know, I tend to think the two fundamental modalities we have is we can be expanding, we can be growing, or we can be uh, stagnating and uh, de declining. And, and um, the maintenance part, just keeping the lights on, that, 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 part, of our, that part of our society will work, um, you know, less well much less well in the stagnant one, just as much. You know, the, the places where we have, you know, the, the Flint, Michigan, uh, where you don't have clean drinking water, well, it's also, you, you know, it's also been a declining, um, you know, auto industry there for, for decades. And, and, and so I think these things are, you know, are, are super tightly, mm -hmm. super tightly linked in practice. But, uh, but what? Well, I think, I think, I think, I think, I think, I think we're not measuring it properly. So I think that, uh, I think the stagnation problem is much more serious than the economic statistics indicate because we are today, um, most people's um, work is in the economy, whereas in the 50s and 60s, the work that women did wasn't measured. And therefore, things have progressed less 
since the 50s than the, the data would indicate. So for example, if you have a you know, one income household with the wife raising the kids, that only that one income gets counted as part of the GDP. Today you have a two income household with a third person hired to do childcare. And that looks like it's a much bigger GDP and, um, and it actually is not. So I think there are, um, you know, I think there are a lot of things that are very good about feminism, but we, but we should also not downplay the ways in which um, it's, it's led us to an exaggerated view of um, GDP growth and that we're doing even less well than it looks because the work of women was not counted properly in the 50s and 60s. But there's a class issue, I think this is very important here, which is to say, if we had maintenance workers who were organized who could threaten to strike, then all of a sudden their plight and predicament would be much more the center mm -hmm. of attention. Look at the maintenance workers at Harvard. It's so easy to overlook. Now let them all decide not to come in for two weeks. Harvard comes to a stop, whereas Roberto and I go on vacation. A few people notice, but that's about it. <laughs> but these maintenance workers shut the whole place yeah. down. But we've got such a weak labor movement that it's easy to have. You see the point I'm making? Do you agree with that? But, but, but well, wait no, a let, minute. Let, 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 yeah. let, let our brother answer yeah. that question. Um, well, I, I, uh, I, I can't speak to the, the, Har the I think the Harvard context. We were talking about workers in general, workers in general, organized workers in, ge in general. If you also think about that. Let him answer that question, my dear sister. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to cut you off, but I mean, I want to make sure that your, your voice is heard on, on, on these issues, especially um, about workers organized. Yeah, I, 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 look, I think, I think we have, uh, I think I think I think we have you know I think the private sector unions are relatively weak. I think public Absolutely. sector unions are way too powerful. Um, too powerful. Way too powerful. Way too powerful. Oh, they're um, still so. No, 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 no. Come, come on. They're, they're bankrupting every uh, every blue the state in this unions. country. Uh, they, uh, no, it's it's a it's a giant scam, right? But you got to privatize educational institutions running amok. Uh, I I think that uh, I think that uh, you underestimate how. Uh, it's, 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 it's a form of just massive intergenerational theft that's going on in all the, uh, the blue states where it's the, uh, the retired government workers that are uh, being subsidized by the, by the whole system in ways that uh, everybody else would, would, would not be. So, but then you got so the I, profiteers who are running to the bank in private schools because they've got access to unbelievable resources. Now some of them coming out of the state legislature. Well, maybe you should get the public schools to, to work better than they are. Well, yes. that's another issue. So, that's another issue so, there. But we're talking about the clash of public, private, and the issue partly, and this is very important, because we really haven't talked about the culture of greed, which is crucial. Now, you know that's also a issue of who we are as human beings, so we need some accountability of that. But we have cultures that reinforce greed, be it on Wall Street, well, be it privateers, and also be it in public sphere. Well, you know, if we, if we, if we want to go down the litany of uh, mortal sins from medieval Catholicism, um, you know, I would, um, I, would, I, I would not start with greed. I would start with envy, because uh, that is the one of the seven mortal sins that is still completely taboo. And I believe that is the, uh, that is the cardinal one that, that drives Dante, our society Dante more than Dante said it was the most odious of all the vices. And, but greed the these days need, deserves much sure, more attention than envy. But uh, we, well, well, we disagree on that. But. Yeah, okay. Question in the back. But, but wait a minute, Cornell, just a minute. I, I want to, in, oh, you want intervene to in this, oh, sure, sure, in this sure, conversation sure. and stand up for vanguardism, which just now it seemed to me you, you, you didn't give the... Uh, you didn't respond uh, what, what, what fully. What do you mean by vanguardism? So, so this, this question of advanced technologies and advanced practices. So we don't need 19th century technologies to deal with fundamental maintenance problems. We need 21st century technologies. And the, the, the potential of these advanced technologies is to uh, liberate humanity, all of humanity as much as possible, from routine work, including cooking, doing the laundry, and so forth, so that our time can be resolved, reserved for the not yet repeatable, and for taking care of one another, for taking care of one another. So the, the advanced practices that we're speaking about are not for a narrow elite. They're for everyone. And what, what we're discussing is how we get there, how we get to the situation in which the advanced practices are widely disseminated and liberate an increasing part of humanity 
from the kind of work that can be done by machines. No human being should be condemned to do the work that can be done by a machine. And that, that's the larger emancipatory promise of this vanguardism, yes. Yes, although, again, I, yes. The, the, the quibble or disagreement here is um, you're always focused on inequality. I'm more focused on stagnation. I don't think, you know, I don't think we have self-driving cars, even in Silicon Valley. They're not coming. They're, people are too slow. They're not working on it. So yeah, we always have a narrative. We have this Google propaganda mm, narrative. Mm. I'm not and, narrowly focused on inequality. I and, I think, uh, and I think a fundamental defect of the position of the progressives is that they cast themselves in this role, this pietistic role, of humanizing the project of their adversaries. The force that commands the agenda is the force that most credibly embodies the cause of constructive energy, of creation, of dynamism. Um, so, so I'm on your side in that. One, one, other, one, other, one, one, other, one other quibble is uh, that I think the, um, I, 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 I strongly agree that um, if you can automate uh, something, you should just automate it and shouldn't force someone to the drudgery of doing a job that can be done by a machine. Um, now, at the same time, let, let us acknowledge that, um, let's say a job, the way most people think of it, is something you learn once and then can do repeatedly for the rest of your life. And, um, and so there's a very negative way to rephrase what you said, which, which is you're saying jobs are going away. That's great. You're just going to have to reinvent yourself every day for the rest of your life and come up with new stuff to do. And that's what's mm -hmm. scary to people. That's, that's what the precariat mm -hmm. feels. Like, you know, when I, when I, you know, I was attacked here for just suggesting people become entrepreneurs. That's way too scary for people. That you shouldn't, you should get off your, you should get off your track job, you should start a company. That's, people experience that. That already is, is far too scary, and I'm not. I'm not. I'm not even. I'm not even judging that. But uh, but you know, if, if 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 you if you give the advice, um, everybody should be an entrepreneur. That would be so unpopular, right? Because that's people want security. They don't. They don't want. They don't want that degree of risk. There was a question in the back in the middle. Yes, and then back here. Hi, I'm sure. Um, Well, I, it's 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 always it's always hard to have a systematic answer to that I I I I think I have a lot of uh, people who work with me who um, are um, do do give me very frank feedback on when they think I'm doing something that's crazy or wrong or or misguided um, I think uh, you know it's it's a it's a sort of a smaller um, office uh, smaller um, uh, office type dynamic which has you know a lot of uh, crazy things that go with it, but uh, you know it's 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 uh, we, what we try to avoid, and I think generally do is is the uh, the large corporate uh, uh, po political thing where um, there's never any feedback, and in, in, in sort of these in a, in a large corporate setting, um, you, you generally have um, you know you have you have sort of this new speak politically correct language people use to uh, to never actually um, engage in, um, in in the real issues. Um, I think the, you know, I, I, I do think this, um, I, I'm always hesitant to, to sort of sh sharply separate out um, uh, doing, um, you know, um, the, the, the non, um, sort of a nonprofit from a for-profit thing. I, I mean, I think, I think they're, they're, they're very different, but, uh, but you should always be asking, you know, why, why is it what you're doing, why is what you're doing good? And uh, I'm, I'm, I'm somewhat uncomfortable with the, uh, the the sort of shift where you make money and then you do things in a in a nonprofit context and it's sort of this uh, the somewhat schizophrenic thing doesn't doesn't make that much sense, but but again look the, the caveat to this is, is you know you're always Im embedded in the system it's hard to be self aware mm -hmm. about mm -hmm. these things, and then uh, there, there's a way in which the language always gets hijacked over time in ways that are very tricky so I think one of the things that was very good in Silicon Valley a decade or two decades ago was that companies talked about being mission-oriented. They had some mission that was beyond making money, that was about, uh, about, uh, about um, changing the world for the better. Um, today, that just sounds hackneyed, because it's sort of become 
this, uh, this somewhat fake formula. And so that's, that's sort of what we have to always be on the lookout for, that, uh, that uh, even the things that, um, that are you know, good and authentic can, uh, can too mm. easily mm. Um, um, turn into formulas that are, in practice are the but opposite. But even on a personal note, just like the system, even like myself, do you have uh, deep Christian identity and sensitivity and sensibility? How does that feed into your own witness in public sphere, in the private sphere? I mean, we love uh, Rene Girard, yes. towering figure that he yes. has been and so forth. How does that fit in just briefly? Well, I, I identify myself as Christian. Um, uh, I think it sort of means, you know, uh, uh, I, I think the, uh, the, um, the, the, um, the Girard, who is this philosopher um, that I uh, studied under at Stanford, influenced me tremendously. Uh, uh, one of his key ideas was that uh, um, um, a lot of what we do is involves imitation. And we have role models, and we copy uh, role models. And if you have, um, you know, if you have, um, uh, if, if, if it's the wrong role model, you copy what other people want, and then that leads to envy or greed. Mm -hmm. uh, everybody wants what everybody wants is often, you know, this formula for, for, uh, for, for violence. And, uh, and uh, that uh, what you, you, you want uh, desire uh, not to be horizontally mediated. You don't want to just try to keep up with the Joneses, try to keep up with the people around you. That's sort of a violent, escalatory, mimetic dynamic. Uh, you want it to be somehow transcendent. You want to, um, you, you, know, you want to look up to people or beings with whom you're not actually in competition. But to follow and, Jesus, and so that's, 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 to follow Jesus is to head toward the cross, though, right? Well, the that's, service that's, that you give to the into, least of these. We get into well, we get. Uh, yes, yes, that's true, um, and then there also are ways in which that that can get hijacked. You know, so it's uh, hijacked by churches and so or, forth. Or communists. Oh, oh, we don't worry about the communists. I do, I do though. I worry no, about them a lot. Not too many around. We got more Christians running around damaged, creating damage than communists right now. Well, I, I'm still worried about the communists. But, but even if even if we focus on both, though, I mean, even if we focus on both, you would agree that this we, we look, we this service I, that you render. I, for yes. the least of these. Uh, yes, yes, and I also and I also worry about the people who use that rhetoric as oh, a way to beat other no, people No, it could be used a lot of it's different well, ways. Well, Absolutely. Well, Question in the back well, with the brother in the hat, Brother James. We have to worry about that's it right. Okay, there you go. Being here, that's, that is an intriguing comment, but um, I, uh, in terms of complexity, there's complexity in logistics, like supply chains, and there's complexity in computerization, that sort of innovation, um, uh, avionics. A distinguished graduate of the law school, Ralph Nader, just lost his grand niece on that plane that went down in Ethiopia, and is calling for a boycott of Boeing, and particularly the Boeing 737 Max 8, I guess it's called. Um, so, doesn't that that sort of gives a very dramatic example of where complexity becomes a problem? And you're working in in a way, in you know, with computerization. Do you not worry about? Well, I, I, I guess my my intuition is that um, that um, sort of a more advanced technological civilization probably uh, becomes uh, becomes more complex, and then um, to the extent we're not able to deal with it, and I think you know the the, the 737 uh, thing seems quite disturbing. It's sort of like the question you have is, can the U.S. still build airplanes? Are, are we still capable of doing mm. this? Have we? Mm. Or have, you know? And so I'm. I'm, um, you know, the, the optimistic way to frame it is things are getting so much more complicated, shouldn't we slow it down a little bit? And uh, my more pessimistic worry is, wow, things have degraded so much that our country can't even build airplanes like it used to. And, um, and that we have a, mm. we've had this shift you know, away from complexity. And there are always these questions, you know, why this stuff, why this stuff has happened. The, um, you know, w one explanation I would have for the shift away from complex coordination, again, I'll focus on the Silicon Valley narrow Silicon Valley context that I feel I understand best, uh, is um, the only game in town for the last quarter century has been consumer internet, which are thin you know, um, websites. Um, they're easy to code, easy to do. It's, it's nothing super complicated about any of these companies. They, they, get, you know, they, they get more involved as you scale them, but it's very easy to start. It doesn't require, it's not like building an airplane or, or you know, a, a rocket or, or anything, anything like that. Um, and, um, and the question, um, you know, the, the, the sort of the competitive question I, I, I do wonder about is, is whether the shift towards 
less complex consumer internet forms of technology um, was because all the more complex stuff um, um, we're going to get beaten by China. You're going to get beaten. Um, uh, it, it's not allowed on a regulatory basis. For some reason, people have figured out that the more complex stuff doesn't uh, doesn't quite work. You know, you of, you often want complex things to be protected with intellectual property. If the intellectual property doesn't protect you, um, your best bet is okay. I'm going to do something mm. really simple. It, it'll take off exponentially. It's going to take over the world. It doesn't matter if I have no copyright protection because um, because um, because it'll be the brand or the scale that, that, that protects me. And so, um, you know, I'm, I'm not against consumer internet companies, I'm not against what, what, what Silicon Valley's been doing, but I, um, I find it much more disturbing how, um, how, uh, how there are all these other things that have not been done in Silicon Valley or elsewhere. We had this uh, pro-tech manifesto about almost a decade ago where the, the tagline was, you know, they promised us flying cars and all we got was 140 characters. And that was not meant to be a narrow critique mm. of Twitter. I think Twitter's a perfectly you know, successful, good company. The two or 3,000 people who work there have you know, well-paying jobs that are pretty safe. But, uh, but we, we want to be doing more than that. I, I would still like flying cars, even though um, uh, you know, maybe, uh, maybe, um, maybe not made by Boeing. Yes, right in the middle. Yes, uh-huh. Well, again, I, my my um my framework is not an egalitarian framework, so that's not uh, that's that, that's not the question I was answering. I I, I think the uh, my framework is charismatic. It's about role models. It's about um um you, you change things by by changing the culture by setting examples, and uh, and so I think there are all sorts of ways to reduce inequality um, in hiring or executives or or things like that. But that will not change the culture, from my perspective. And what I was trying to address was, how do you um, how do you shift uh, the culture in Silicon Valley on this? And I think um, there are things you can do that can make it seem more egalitarian or make it more egalitarian in certain ways. But the way you change the culture is mm -hmm. that uh, you know the, that you have that not all the founders of these companies are, are white men. But but you would admit though, just in terms of uh, defending liberty for all that there are sexist and, and, and racist and even homophobic impediments as part of the nepotistic system at various sites that make it difficult for people who have been marginalized, even to gain assets to those networks, let alone capital and credit and so forth. I mean, yeah, that's I, just, I, a, just I a, this empirical question. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to, no, I'm not, obviously we still have all sorts of forms of, of um, you know, it's all embedded in history. The, the, the and, history, that's and exactly. It's all these things. The structures I'm not, I'm not, of domination you know, of can, the past we still can, having. We can, we can have lots of debates about what one should do about it, but, uh, but I, mm -hmm. I, I, there's, there's no part of me that questions the history. So, so you agree with what, what, what? Well, I agree with the history. Yeah, I, I, yeah. I, okay. Well, I, I was trying, I was, again, my, mine was just practically, you know, what does one do but, to but change But given that history, what does one then attempt to? I still think you have to somehow start, you have, in, in Silicon Valley, you have to start a company. Mm -hmm. No, no, I hear Question in the back. Yes. Oh, we got a brother Unger in the house. So good to see. You. This is one of the brilliant, brilliant, brilliant children of Roberto Unger. <laughs> give it up. Give it up. <laughs> Sorry to out you like that, brother. <laughs> you look. You, they look just like each other. You all. So you can't. You can't escape. Don't no, go right in. <laughs> San Francisco, if you want 4% growth, 
the rest of the country still needs to be able to participate. So if a small town mayor uh, or governor came to you and said, I'm from Montana, we want high tech in Montana. Do you have a sense of what sort of institutional program you would sketch for someone in that position? Well, I'm, again, this is where I'm, I'm, um, I'm very skeptical about the limits of what, what one can do institutionally. I mean, there's, there certainly are all the sort of regulatory stuff. There's the housing costs. There are all, all those kinds of factors. They're normally fine in the, in the uh, smaller, smaller cities. Um, I, I would, let, me, let me try sort of an intermediate, um, um, rephrase the question, try to answer a slightly different, mm -hmm. more intermediate level question. So I think it's maybe not a question of, you know, um, you know, how do we how do we bring innovation from uh, Silicon Valley to Saint Saint Hel Helena or whatever in Montana Helena Mon Mont Bozeman? How, how do we get it to Bozeman to a small town of mm -hmm. you know, 40, 50,000 people? Um, it's uh, it's how do we get it to these intermediate scale places like you know Atlanta or Denver or Saint Louis or or Houston or Dallas, which is um, you know. So I I, th I think I, I because I do think there's there's you know there's a network effect. There's sort of there are there are certain dynamics of scale where you know you need um, you need things to be happening for things to happen. You need a critical mass of talented people to um, to be able to do things. And so I don't I, I think the in innovation can be spread well beyond these three or four places. Um, whether it can be spread evenly throughout the whole country that seem, that seems like a much much harder task. And I wouldn't um, let that much harder task. It shouldn't distract us from trying to to equalize it beyond these these three or four places, um, you know, for, for what it's worth, I, I think we are we are just about at the break point on on uh, on Silicon Valley. And even though this is very boring, it is just the housing costs. You know, when it's two thousand dollars for a one bedroom apartment in two thousand eleven in San Francisco, that's what you have in a gold rush town comes with the territory. When it's four thousand dollars for a one bedroom apartment, that starts to become you know a ridiculous tax that. Uh, that, that, that is going to push people elsewhere. There was a, you know, there was a, um, there was a uh, discussion I had in, uh, at Stanford University early 2005. The question came up, where will we find the next Google? And uh, sort of a search problem, very interesting to students, investors, where do you find this next, hmm. the next big uh, Google company? And you can't type it into the Google search engine. Um, anyway, my, 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 um, my somewhat obnoxious, but uh, I thought still accurate answer was, I thought there was a 50% chance you would find it within five miles of the auditorium we were speaking at Stanford. You know, you could argue that the next Google was Facebook. Uh, Facebook was located 1.8 miles from that auditorium, 1.7 miles by bike. Um, um, now, if I give, the, if I had to give the same talk today in Silicon Valley, I would say it's way less than 50% chance that it's anywhere in Silicon Valley. And so I do think, um, I do think things are going to be somewhat more distributed in the next decade, in the decade ahead. I think there's certain you know, there's certain uh, monopolies Silicon Valley had on knowledge of how to start companies, or the capital was all concentrated. And I think, uh, I think those, are, those are much less robust. And, uh, and as a result, some of the more negative effects of, um, because they're not actually going to build more housing, the zoning won't get fixed, the yeah, negative effects yeah. will dominate the positive. And, uh, and I would bet on, um, on parts outside of Silicon Valley even though I wouldn't necessarily bet on Bozeman, Montana. Just, just not, not, not criticizing it either, just to be clear. Question. So suppose we say, fine, we're going to write off all the super small cities. You want a mid-sized one. So then we give you the mayor of Atlantic City. And he says, I have this mid-sized city. I want it to participate in the sort of advanced production that goes on in Silicon Valley. What do I do with my local government to make this happen? What's your answer? It's, uh, um, I, I, look, I think, I think all of, it's, 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 it's probably anchored all, um, like I, I don't know, if the, I still don't know if there's a political intervention on a mayoral level. Atlantic City is sort of a again sort of an unusually messed up place. You're you're just asking me really hard questions here. Um, you know, it's like yeah, you're you're addicted to um to this corrupt casino-based tourism, and uh, that's that's obviously better than most of the other things you could be doing. Even though it's um it's sort of less good than it used to be because other people figured out to do that as well. So that's that's sort of why you're stuck in Atlantic City, um, and then um, and then. To, to, um, to get something else, I, I tend to think it ends up being anchored on, you know, on, a, on a small number of very successful businesses. I don't know if um, it's, 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 not a, mm. you know, it's not egalitarian. It's, um, you know, people might be um, created equal. Corporations are not. You know, some corporations are much better, much more valuable than others. And, um, and so in practice, it's not, um, you, you know, we need to let 100 flowers bloom, have 100 different 
companies. It's we need to get you know, just a few that really break through, that really succeed. And, um, and that's, the, you know, that's, that's the kind of um, answer that, um, that politicians don't want to hear because they want to talk about you know, um, small business in the sense of letting 100 flowers bloom. They don't want to talk about it in the sense of having um, you know, a, um, a few local champions that, that really drive the but, economy. But you would so admit that there are certain conditions under which certain monopolies and oligopolies are very dangerous. Um, like, like Harvard. There's a lot of examples. Yes, of a, lot of yeah. examples. <laughs> a lot of examples. A lot of absolutely, examples. Absolutely, absolutely. But I'm thinking in the private sector as well. Yeah, but I think it's not just the private sector. We shouldn't always just uh, well, limit, yeah, limit I, the private I, sector. I, I, I'm with you. You, you, got, you got this hand going up. Sorry, who, who's? Your friend, Elon Musk. Um, man, I, uh, I think, um, I think that uh, there's a lot I can say. I mean, I've known Elon for close to 20 years at this point. Uh, I think that uh, you know he's working around the clock on. Uh, he's the CEO of two separate companies. He has five children. Um, I mean, it is. It's like a 100-hour. Um, a week, work week, um, and uh, I mean, he does so much more than I do that uh, I, 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 would, I would never, you know, I, would, I wouldn't want to critis criticize Elon for not doing enough. You know, it's maybe, maybe he's doing the wrong things, but, mm -hmm. but uh, the, the intensity is, uh, is, uh, is, is really extraordinary of, 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 what, of what, what he's done. It's maybe, maybe it's too much, but it's, it's definitely not too little. I think, um, well, I, again, I, I, I'm, I'm hesitant to sort of go through all, you know, other people's, you know, other people's um, uh, motives and, and, and whatnot. I think. No, his, no, his no, question no. about education. You're reform. saying you don't believe that education can reform, uh, <coughs> but Hassan has said why. So I was like, you know. Well, um, I, I didn't say it can't. I just said I was pessimistic about very it. Difficult. I think it's hard. It's very, very hard very to reform. Yeah. And I guess, I guess, I guess the, uh, I don't know. I think, I think the, the, the naive version would be is, is. Um, are the universities, are they like um, a corporation or are they like um, a government? And so corporations, if they're too screwed up, they go bankrupt and, um, and then you have new corporations. Um, for government to go broke, it's really bad and so you can often have a dysfunctional government that persists for, for a very long time. And I would submit that, uh, that um, the universities are more like the government than like a private corporation and the, the proof of it is that our top universities are still the same as they were 200, 300 years ago. And uh, that, that suggests that it's incredibly hard to change things. It's incredibly hard to shift the pecking order. If you have something that's that robust, it's probably um, somewhat insensitive to how well it's run, to how good a job it does, or all these things. It, you know, it, it's just going to keep going. The, the brand is so strong. I, 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 had this, I had this idea of starting a new university as, as a nonprofit thing that I wanted hmm. to do hmm. back in 2000, uh, 2007. It's going to be the, the one, you know, one really big idea. Was, I mean, Teal, sorry, Teal University? Well, I didn't, I didn't even care about oh, that, yeah, that naming. But, but, uh. Um, but uh, one of my colleagues spent a, um, a year and a half, and she looked at uh, all the universities that had been started in the US in the preceding 100 years, 1907 to 2007. And it was basically a sorry tale of money wasted, donor intent betrayed, just failure. I mean, there were some, mm. some, there were some small, smallish things that were sort of idiosyncratic, but sort of a general all-purpose university. There's not been a successful one started in 100 years. And that tells you something about how um, incredible, power, powerful the network effects brands what have you, of the existing in, institutions are. Institutions and, um, and then my, my suspicion is if you, have, you know, if you have an immortal being and the universities are fundamentally immortal, um, it can be very corrupt. It doesn't die, even if it becomes very corrupt. 
Last query. Yes. Um, and there's, I use culture in this very broad sense. So there's, you know, there's education, there's all, all the regulatory stuff that I would, I would, I would tend to um, uh, drill on. There's, you know, there's a um, somewhat new agey version that I, I, I'm also inclined to think is part of it, even though it's hard to know how important it is. But that, uh, that you know, there is a lot of learned helplessness. People don't think they can do things, and therefore they don't do things. Uh, if you think you can, you will. If you think you can't, you won't. Um, you know, it's the power of positive thinking is not necessarily, you know, enough to um, uh, is not necessarily enough to solve problems. Power of negative thinking that is really powerful. It's always dispositive. Mm -hmm. If you think you can't mm -hmm. do something, you will definitely not uh, not do that. And uh, and I think that is, you know, that's sort of uh, again there, there are reasons for it, but uh, but sort of this uh, this um, the 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 um, widespread sense of learned helplessness is, you know, if I could made, wave a wand and change that, I think that would be super powerful. And uh, you know, I've, one, one of these sort of new age things that I've started to just ask people uh, uh, who are starting companies is, uh, uh, it's, it's sort of a stupid question, but it's, uh, it's just, tell me what's going to happen with your company. And, um, and you know, mm. and from the answer, you can tell whether it's going to succeed or not. It's a, I mean, it has a, surpri it has a crazy amount of content. So we, we have to end now, is but, three but oh, the yeah. enhancement of agency, this theme, yes. Yes. this is the ground on which the right and the left can meet and make common cause against the center. Yes, well, the, ce the, the, the center established in our country is yes. that, is that, uh, is that there's no agency. I mean, this is like, I think, the, uh, the AI narrative, culturally, what I don't like about AI is that it's, uh, it's, um, it's that machines are going to think because humans aren't, because we don't want humans to have agency. We don't want humans to think. And we want the machines to do our thinking for us. And it's the opposite. The machines should do the repetitious so we can do the rest. Yes, but that's, that, yeah, but AI is meant in the opposite yes. sense. And we should, mm -hmm. we should never give up agency. I